I was diagnosed HIV positive in 1998 on the 15th of May. And then 2002, because of my ex-boyfriend died, and then the rumors said he died because of the, the, the virus. I've been diagnosed earlier 2006 with HIV. I was very sad and angry, but I consoled myself that whom can I be angry for? Because the one I'm supposed to be angry, he's gone already. Because most are educated enough to know that this is not TB alone. Come, man, husband, let me go test. I think this is my 12th year now, knowing that I'm actually living with HIV. That time when I was diagnosed, there were no medication. And uh, we went, we test this negative. I came out positive. I was so devastated. I was so angry by myself. I couldn't even hear the noise of a car that crossed in the road. The person that infected me, he was actually making it his mission to tell everybody that can to listen that because we broke up, I am now claiming that he actually infected me with HIV. I couldn't even figure out where did I got this virus. I was blaming so many people. But now I'm fine. I was planning my funeral that time, but now I can't plan anything because I can say that I'm normal as every person. This is the story of a country that fell victim to the circumstances of history. A story about the people living with HIV who were brave enough to carry on life normally. And a story about a virus that has no cure, only a drug that can slowly give back hope. AIDS was first detected in 1981, when many homosexual men were found to be dying of a rare form of cancer. Doctors termed the disease GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency. But in 1982, the disease was found to be blood-related and not confined to the highly discriminatory packaging of homosexuals, hemophiliacs, heroin users and hoes. In 1984, it was found that HIV was in fact the cause of AIDS and three years later, AZT became the first drug approved to treat HIV. But it was not until 1996 that the most effective three cocktail treatments of ALVs became available worldwide. We have built this country on a pile of skulls and bodies. That's what we've done repeatedly. We have allowed people to die. We have allowed children to die in the most shocking way. We met with history lecturer Carla Sampiras, who has been researching and writing on the epidemic for six and a half years. The early versions of ARVs, the first rounds of ARVs, were available on a trial basis at Johannesburg General Hospital, which had the first AIDS clinic. For multiple political and economic factors, the South African government did not roll out treatment, despite all the proof of how well it worked. Because you had this weird situation that you, know, you have 94 and AIDS becomes a, a presidential lead project under the Mandela administration. Um, and nothing really happens. There's a few more campaigns, there's more condoms. We carry on with these ABC messaging. We knew that ARVs prolonged life and the government deliberately did not roll out ARVs. Neither did they roll out anything else. So after, after that, um, you see the Mbeki administration and Mbeki's failure to engage with an ARV rollout program based in some ways on an on a inappropriate questioning of the histories of Western biomedicine and the profits of massive companies, but not supported by any 
systematic alternative campaigns. Um, and of course, even Manta Shabalala Munsamang's idea that you didn't need these things, you needed nutrition. And of course you need nutrition. You can't take pills on an empty stomach. It's not a great thing. You know, you will get sick without food. You, it, you're not going to get better. But the argument that if we give out, you know, lemon and oil and whatever else, it's going to make people better, on one level is, is problematic, but let alone on, on whether or not it's appropriate. If that's the policy you're going to take, then give out the olive oil. Nobody was going around giving out olive oil to people. And you're talking about poverty alleviation. So I'm so angry about this. You're talking about poverty alleviation and the price of a small bottle of olive oil is 75 rand. You're living on a public grant, on a government grant. There was a, such an inconsistency um, outside of just whether or not the question, you know, the discussions or the nature of the discussions that were going on, that it, it, it made no sense. So that's fine. We should, of course, always interrogate knowledge. But while you're doing that, you can't just let people die. But it took basically taking the government to court to make the rollout of AOVs a reality. And that, that's a weird precedent. You shouldn't have to take a government to court every time you want something done. Being HIV positive was once a death sentence, until 2002, when the Treatment Action Campaign won their case against then Health Minister Mantu Shabalala Msamang, forcing her to roll out ARVs to pregnant women. And from that moment onwards, the future of HIV positive people looked a bit brighter. Ntutu Mkhalisa works as a counsellor at the Raphael Centre. She feels very strongly about the prevention of mother-to-child treatment. Prevention of mother-to-child transmission is, is very close to my heart because it actually allowed me to be a mother. I decided to have a child eight years into diagnosis and at the time they were still piloting the, the dual therapy in our province. When I was told that my, my, my daughter was actually HIV negative, I, I could not, I, I can't even today begin to, to, descri to describe the feeling. It's like there is this huge weight that has been lifted off your shoulders. I am going to be there when my daughter is going for her first date. I'm going to be there when my daughter gets married. I'm going to be there when she graduates from university. I'm going to be there for her 21st birthday. So these are the goals that I have set for me. If anything else fails, then I will know that I was a good mother to her and she will always carry that with her wherever she goes. It would seem that ARVs are working well. And despite our very late start, professionals are hopeful about the life-saving drug. The treatment is free of charge. You don't pay a cent, everybody can get the treatment, it's always available. They swallow them properly, they, they make a huge difference. You've got somebody who's at death's door and a few months later, or a few months to a year later, they're a normal, healthy person. Here I've got only one death within these two years. The reason why is because that patient was not compliant. She was drinking, she was not taking the treatment regularly. It's not like a death sentence for me anymore. I have seen HIV clients on the brink of death. But when they start antiretrovirals, this is really like a miracle drug. We visited two women in the Eastern Cape who are both open about their HIV statuses. They allowed us into their lives and told us their stories of overcoming the disease. Linda lives alone in Extension 7 in Grahamstown and has been living with the virus for 14 years. She is a prominent advocate of HIV awareness and ARV adherence. I said no, I agreed to the HIV test because I didn't even thought that I might be HIV positive because I had a one boyfriend. So that boyfriend was cheating on me. Sometimes he took the other girl and then he chased me away and then I, I have to accept the situation. So I didn't even know about the condoms. In June 16, I, I, I started to disclose in 2000. Since then, I was open, talking openly about my status, even in the community. It is not easy, but because I want to live a long life, so I have to, I have that courage that I'm going to take these tablets. So they helped me a lot because I don't have any of the opportunistic infections.
and I'm, I'm not sick. Okay. Esme lives with her husband Peter in Mulne Estate in East London. She found out that she was HIV positive in November 2011 and was open about it immediately. It was hard because I just lost my mother and I just couldn't believe how the bloody hell can this happen to me. My mother, you know, just passed away, HIV, an AIDS positive, with TB altogether and yeah, I come along with the same thing. What's, you know, supposed to happen now? Am I going to follow my mother dying? No, I can't. Who am I going to leave Peter behind with my whole family? No. Here's me, get a grip. Get a life. Sometimes he doesn't want us to use condoms. He's like, no, I want a bit of this AIDS. I said, for heaven's sake, you can't have a, bit, a little bit of this AIDS that I have. Think about your children, your grandchildren, you know. And he's like, no, they'll take care of each other. Not that he doesn't care. You must know, man, how a couple thing works. If I should, maybe, not take my treatment and die, obviously I will die. Most people don't understand the difference between HIV and AIDS. HIV is the initial virus that starts killing immune cells, weakening our body's ability to fight disease. AIDS is a syndrome where you have caught an opportunistic infection such as TB and you become chronically ill. However, ARVs have been described as a miracle drug in the control of HIV and the prevention of AIDS. The experts explain how they work and why patients sometimes default from treatment. In the process of the virus infecting the cell, it gets into the nucleus of the cell, it hijacks the, the nuclear material of the cell and uses that to make copies of itself. And the ARVs block um, at various levels, block that process. And different groups of drugs will affect different enzymes. So there's all different, there's about three or four different ones that there are. Unfortunately, on their own, the virus learns how to fight them very quickly and, and leads to resistance. So we have to do three drugs at a time. We can't just do one, so each patient has to have at least three drugs at a time. Tenifer, Lamphidine, uh, Anthrazim, they are always. In fact, I went to go fetch two months batch today. I did, yes. Mm. Is it Tenifer, is it Anthrazim? Yeah, I don't know. Is it Ayurveda? It's very difficult. I mean, if you just think for yourself, when you've got a, a, a bacterial infection, you have to take antibiotics for seven days. It's difficult for me as a nurse also to comply to take tablets three times a day. Now, just imagine you have to take it every day for the rest of your life. Some of these pills, you take it once daily. That's easier. But what about those pills that you have to take three times? What about those you have to take twice a day? Even with the best adherence in the world, with patients really being careful and never missing doses, over time the natural progression of the disease will be to develop resistance. And it's expected. You, you, cannot, you just know you'll never keep a person on one regime ad infinitum without them getting resistance. There is only two regiments of ARVs in South Africa. So if one is resistant to, to regiment one, he can only move to regiment two. And if one is resistant to Regimen 2, there's no Regimen 3 in South Africa. The vast majority of our patients respond really well to first-line therapy. And if they're not doing well on first-line therapy, there's usually a different reason. There's another reason why they're not doing well. ARVs are not like any other tablets. ARVs, one have to use them for the rest of his or her life. So many people, when they found that they are better, they tend to think that they are cured from AIDS and then they will stop using ARVs. Patients who don't have social support, who have disclosure issues, will have problems with adherence. But I think the major thing is it's just difficult to commit to taking drugs every single day for the rest of your life. If one is, uh, is drug resistant and sleep with someone without a condom and infect that person, that person will be infected with a drug resistant strain. Therefore, that person will not be able to be helped by ARVs. It's actually all about adherence. 
This treatment, it's all about actually putting those pills in your mouth every day. ARV misuse is a big problem in South Africa. There are many socio-economic factors behind this. Stigma is a huge problem. Some patients believe if they are seen at clinics trying to get help, other people will ostracize them, so they opt not to get help at all. Many patients believe the side effects of ARVs are off-putting and prefer not to take them at all. Alcohol abuse also plays a factor as both drinking and ARVs can be toxic to the vital organs. Used in combination, the results can be fatal. Oh, when I have a little bit of wine, yes, of course, you can never have alcohol with pills, any kind of pills, more especially these drugs. You're going to be fucking yourself. You have a glass of wine and you don't, yeah. and you don't drink that pill. What do, you, what do you do with the pill? I flush it in the drain or in the toilet. You can't must. You know, they do count your pills when you go back to check on you, whether you, you know, did you default on it and what, 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 what. Drinking, however, is not the only way ARVs have been misused. Of the three cocktail treatment, a powerful drug called ephavirenz has been highly sought after. They're getting their treatment, but they have to hide them. But there are those people that are standing there knowing that so and so is taking treatment and they want to see which treatment are you taking. And if you're using EFE, which is a favorance that makes you dizzy at, when you take it, you only take it at night. But when you take it, it makes you dizzy. So they use it with e Daha to make Iwunga as a drug. There is anecdotal evidence to suggest that some patients do sell their ARVs, that some patients do um, use and abuse their favorites. We do pull counts regularly. As a, as a, as a r routine check on our ALV patients. So when, every time they month they come in, we will check how many leftovers they've got. And we know exactly how many they should have. And we don't, I don't, m my sense is it's not a huge issue. I think that patients who are selling their ALVs, often those sort of behaviors are caught up in bigger picture stuff. They attack people coming from the clinic, wait for them, disguise themselves as people that are trying to help you get your ARVs, they crush it, and they sell it, and the guys smoke it, and they get very violently high, kill people, and they want more and more and more and more. Other people get rich on it, the people that is robbing the people of it. Upon hearing this, we went searching around for someone who could tell us more about smoking ARVs. But instead, we found someone who could show us. Like from time to time, we like just buy these tablets like from his brother that I know. I think it's called ARVs. It like puts me on like this relaxed kind of a vibe, you know. Just chilling out and put it in a guai and then we smoke it and feels absolutely amazing. Like at the moment to describe it to you, I'll say I'm like drifting on a cloud, but carefree. Yeah, it's, it's nice. And yo, I'm just like feeling so nice and high right now. Most problems of adherence boil down to education and support. The South African government may have launched many education campaigns around HIV and AIDS. However, it still seems that support is lacking and the stigma around support groups still remains. There's still a stigma attached to HIV. People don't want others to know. Even if they are all belonging to the same being HIV positive, they don't want to do that. Information breeds wisdom. So the moment they have more information about what the condition is that they've been diagnosed with, the moment that they're aware um, of the type of lifestyle, the change of lifestyle, the choices that they need to make, the shift from feeling it's a death sentence definitely occurs. Honestly speaking, fuck all is going on amongst the coloured communities. Nothing. Nada. I'm not lying to you. I should have dealt, uh, you know, with the issues that we're dealing with a long time ago, if there were a support group somewhere along the line. Because honestly, for heaven's sake, we do need it.
you know, to speak out, to help people speak out, to talk to government through support groups, you know, stand together. You know, there's nothing here. Nothing. Not only here where I stay, but I mean, just in the current communities, more especially. However, there are places in Grahamstown that are succeeding in educating people about the disease, such as the Jabez Center and the Raphael Center. These places provide a safe haven for HIV positive people to deal with the difficulties of the disease, to learn safe practices and to take a step forwards towards acceptance. I'm usually going, going to the clinics to do the open support group sessions to educate the people that are infected and affected with HIV because if you can see that all of us were affected with HIV whether you are infected or you are not because maybe your cousin or your sister is diagnosed with HIV positive so if you are if you are not HIV infected you are HIV affected so that's why we are going to the clinics and educate the all the people, all the community about this virus that attacks the, the, our nation. I think what motivated me is it's, it's the support that I, I, I've got from my parents, from, from the whole of my family. They gave me a lot of support. It's, there, it's also them who, who showed me this place to come to join the support group for the people who are living with the virus. The Raphael Center helped me so much from long ago because that time when I was diagnosed there were no medication, there was nothing to help people but Raphael Center helped me emotionally because there was nothing to take to heal my heart. There was nothing to help me to heal my emotions but just seeing that there are other people that are also HIV positive. Talk about it as soon as possible to everybody and anybody so that you would get you know a clear basis sit down with your husband and try to figure out how will we get support you know from both sides you know of the family i have accepted myself first because if you are still on denying stage you must continue doing ongoing counseling so that you'll have to accept the situation first if you didn't accept yourself you won't be able to cope with the virus. While finding out that you are HIV positive may be a terrifying experience, modern medicine has changed the life-threatening severity of the disease. If used properly, a person can live a long and healthy life with relatively few health issues. And while the South African history of ARVs may have been very flawed, people are now moving forward with positivity and support. Even me, I want to. Yeah.